Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for being here. I am really excited about um, this webinar this morning for lots of different reasons. Uh, one, because I'm obviously doing this with Sindhur, who has been my tutor and mentor and guide and resource of inspiration for the last two years and now for the rest of my life. Um, and so it feels very cool to be like on this side um, just, I think, facilitating this conversation. Um, I think the other reason I'm really excited is because I think this is a topic that has been on my mind for a really, really long time. Um, and I don't think I've had the courage yet to have sort of like, you know, really gone deep into it. And there's nobody better to do this with Sindhur. So I'm um, really excited about this. Um, hopefully none of us need introductions in this really tight group. Everybody knows who we are. So I think we'll be good to sort of deep dive right away. Um, just, a, just a small note. I know that when you when all signed up, you know, there were a couple of uh, comments and questions you had sort of shared uh, with regards to the webinar. I'm going to keep pulling those wherever relevant as well. But as you hear, the conversation progress today. If you feel like there are questions or comments you'd want to make, please use the chat box and I will sort of moderate and keep bringing that up um, as we engage over the next 60 minutes. Um, okay, cool. So good to start. Oh, wait, you're on mute. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, when you said I've finally had the courage to do this, I was just thinking it's become, it's so sad, right? That we're in a place where so, so many of these topics are important to talk about. It's okay if we disagree. It's okay if, you know, it shakes our worldview on things. But we've gotten to a point where uh, people who have interesting things to say, we put them in a box where they are not open to saying it anymore. And who is losing out in the process, right? It's yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm really happy that you you're doing this, uh, but also a little sad that, uh, it needs that kind of, a you know, okay, yeah. let's do it. Yes. Okay, cool. So I think that, I mean, again, we're going to keep this really freewheeling. It's just really us talking like we always do. Uh, but obviously I had a couple of questions that I wanted to sort of start us off with and then we'll just keep it free flowing um i think the first one that i wanted to sort of uh, you know invite you to sort of share your thoughts on was really like i think the the discourse on dog nutrition has largely been on you know our pet dogs right like that's really where we've spoken most about it and of course the link to you know, wolves, for example, right? The whole concept of ancestral diets, et cetera. Um, but why do you think like it's important for us to look at free living dogs? Why do you think they also need to be part of this conversation? Um, so this has been a pet peeve of mine, both with nutrition and behavior, um, I suppose, which is that um, it seems like um, we want to talk about wolves and then we want to talk about our pet dogs or companion dogs. And then we've left the story in between out of the picture. We mm -hmm. don't want to talk about that. Uh, <clears throat> dogs evolved to become dogs from the predecessor of modern day wolves. Um, one of the estimates goes back to 100, 130,000 years ago, maybe even um, some estimates go even further back. And that's a and evolution into a different species. Now, what does a different species mean? If you, if you look at the conversations around evolution and classification of species, it's not, you know, when I grew up, I thought it was like a very um, clear cut definition. This animal belongs to this species, whereas this animal belongs to, or this flower belongs to this species or these taxonomy um, and classifications. Uh, makes it sound like, you know, if you follow rule this, 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 you will fall into this. But that's not really how classification works. So if you pick up an animal to determine which species this belongs to, we're looking at uh, how many differences are there? What are they more likely to be towards? Is it towards this or towards this? And we all sit on a spectrum. Um, having said that, though, that variation in species, right, that difference, that brought an animal from a wolf 
two so different from a wolf that we said hey you know what we have to put this in a whole other category and let's put this in a dog yeah. and that variation that happened a hundred thousand years ago and there has been changes since then and what has what have those changes been what what was the change involved in a wolf you know proto wolf becoming a dog uh, and what is that the gap the you know the 100000 years ago story versus today's story what is that gap and to me streeties play a significant role in revealing that gap and that is really where we should be spending more of our time and energy understanding if we want to talk about any conversation that has to do with natural history of dogs so anything where you say this used to be what they were and therefore there's like you know that continuum conversation cannot happen if you remove this mm. section and i think a big part of that section being removed is also because a large part of this narrative this kind of a scientific narrative is hugely a post renaissance um you know post enlightenment um western world conversation and particularly towards dogs is post victorian right mm -hmm. and so a lot of that has to do with what the western world is used to seeing what have you seen you have seen dogs in your houses post you know the starting of intentional breeding and creation of breeds and so they see this and there is the wolf and almost i think in the minds of a lot of these scientists who started this conversation it was almost no i shouldn't say scientists i think people who were engaged in that discourse which is a lot outside the scientific world as well has been sort of there was a wolf and then we started domesticating breeding and we got the these breeds yeah. like that is the continuum and streeties are these breeds were created and then they were not taken care of well enough in the in the third world and so they create mm -hmm. streeties happen so it's a little lopsided whereas that's not really the story you know there were yeah. wolves they became free living dogs that domestication process was not necessarily intentional then started intentional breeding that is you know around mm -hmm. the domestication era uh, which is about 10000 years ago and then came the breeds so this is the uh, you know end of yeah. the spectrum and that's why i think streeties have been left out of the conversation and to me it's very significant to bring that back in yeah yeah i think i think it's interesting right because when we even like when we look at like the origins of the domesticated dog today like it goes back to this very exactly what you said like linear process right wolf domestication tera modern day dog right but we know that that's now that's not how it happened i think the other the thing that now has also been coming up through research and you know just again fossil findings archaeological evidence is also that there were so many in in this in these you know 100000 years are we talking about there were so many adaptations of what the dog was across the world right i also think that a big part of uh this this narrative on nutrition has been that the modern day dog even if it's not been as explicit but i think the subtle messaging has been that the modern the dog evolved from europe and north america and so nutrition has to follow those guidelines but we know that that's not that's not true right like we know that there is much more representation across different parts of the world as well yeah i think it'll be interesting to kind of share some of those papers you know i share them mm. with you as well and yeah and it is it is i don't know why but anything to do with dogs i think is very heavily debated and very emotional uh perhaps a good thing i don't i don't know but um i think there are a few considerations one is where where did the domestication happen and uh, and some studies and it's really funny because these studies study the uh, evidence and the breeds in europe and then arrive at a conclusion that this whole thing happened in europe without actually including any data outside of europe into that mix but i think there are some of the recent studies that have been done that talk about an east asian uh, multiple east asian origin um, yeah. based on data collected from these places but also on looking at genetic diversity now that's the way we also mm -hmm. look at human evolution right we look at where we have the maximum amount of genetic diversity and that's kind of 
uh, sort of the where evolution of this particular species probably started from. And of course, Africa has been left out of the conversation for large parts of all, you know, all these studies. So, you know, what was Africa's contribution to it? Because if you look at some of the stories about, I mean, anthropological discussions about human evolution, a lot of them talk about uh, Homo sapiens. And, you know, uh, uh, Harare talks about it in his book as well, right? For those yeah. of you who read sapiens, he talks about why homo sapiens survived you know versus uh, neanderthals or you know homo erectus or any of the others homo sapiens survived because he had the benefit of dog um and if you're going to make that argument then this goes back to back, back to africa right it like, just flat out goes back to yeah. africa um so i think there is there is a lot to think about uh, african origin and uh, east asian origin uh, and the other part of it is domestication as a um, uh, intentional process by human beings. I know that uh, this is definitely the story, or at least what is believed to be the story for other domestic animals that happened during the you know great age of domestication, you know, 15,000, 10, 15, 20,000 years ago, and that thing. But dogs predate that. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, there is, again, you know, it's a he very heavily debated one whether this was an intentional domestication or whether this just happened. happened. You know, mm -hmm. If it's just happened, what is more likely to have happened is um, these animals um, that kind of were the predecessors of wolves um, started figuring out, and again, not intentionally, but started figuring out what it takes to not be killed by human mm -hmm. beings. Mm. Because that's the other megafauna story, right? The other megafauna story is that human beings, wherever we went, most yeah. megafauna disappeared. Uh, the ones yeah. that survived are the ones who very quickly learned to run. <laughs> you see humans, you run, right? And dogs with, with the only interesting counter story there, which is to say, okay, when you see humans, do something else. Fawn, mm. make big eyes kind of a thing. So... Part of that surviving around human beings would also naturally have to include don't eat their food, don't yeah. eat their precious food. And hunting, if you look at gatherer hunter cultures, and I say gatherer hunter cultures because the idea of hunter gatherers again is anthropologically so unsound, right? It is not primarily mm -hmm. hunting and um, yeah, yeah. and a little bit of gathering, gathering. primarily gathering and a little bit of hunting because hunting is an extremely expensive process if you don't have a gun and so mm -hmm. you know there's a very good chance you're going to get killed in the process and so if you look at a lot of gatherer hunter cultures it's the big part of it is you don't let go of any part of the hunt right you consume every little bit everything. of it, you know, yeah. you use everything of it and then if there's this animal called a dog who's like hey i want a piece of that as well I don't see that going very far with human beings. I don't think in our history of our existence, we've been a very, uh, yeah. you know, benevolent, generous <laughs> species kind of a thing. Um, so there is that part of the conversation, which is how did this happen? What were they eating that allowed them to survive in our, amongst us and literally like move in into our spaces, into our houses? What is it that they were eating that allowed them to do that? Uh, and the other part of the conversation is how quickly adaptations happen. If you look at urban species, mm -hmm. <clears throat> many of them like pigeon adaptations to urban environments and things like that happen within a span of a few years. So it's just a few mm -hmm. generations that adaptation is happening so quickly. Um, Belay's uh, Fox's experiment is like what, 30 generations or something like that so quickly. Uh, these, you know, morphological adaptations, you know, change in yeah. the way they look, the be they behave. So it's very hard to imagine that, you know, 20, 30, 100,000 years of living alongside us, uh, eating what has yeah. to be our garbage, right? Yeah. What we are willing to spare to them and adaptations haven't yeah. happened. Like we don't want to think about it. And that diet having also made them one of the most successful species to last alongside us. You yeah. know, very other few, very few animals have free living lives and are successful in such large numbers around us. Yeah. So they must have evolved to be okay with eating what we are willing to throw away and, and thrive on it, not just eat yeah. it, thrive on it. Uh, 
suddenly not so romantic eh <laughs> like you know <laughs> i think that's probably why we don't want to have that conversation we want to imagine that this animal that's inside our house is you know a wolf that we have we have uh, yeah. I, i think that's also the other kind of conversation is why are we so obsessed with wanting to think of our dogs as mini wolves what yeah. is it telling us about us i'll stop rambling now no 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 i mean okay my my head is going in so many different directions um and so i'm just going to like quickly i'm i'm, I'm prioritizing in my mind which direction i want to move in um uh, but okay there's a comment here yes not so romantic but very key i like that thank you absolutely right and i think i think the other thing that i've like constantly thought about is food is a food in general right it's very symbolic of it is a culture symbol it is a cultural symbol right it it is a regional symbol it is a local symbol it defines um you know a certain community defines certain practices beliefs of a certain community the food becomes that representation of it right um and i think that if we if we if we consider if we if we if we hold on to that argument of the fact that here is um a species of animals that adapted simultaneously across the world it wasn't even like it adapted in one corner of the world and then sprinkled everywhere right simultaneous adaptation across the world and, and you mentioned you know references to east asia you mentioned references to africa um i saw some references to um you know parts of central asia including india i saw some references to the middle east right if we look at all of these adaptations then it's likely that food across all of these regions also looked different right it's not like all of these dogs with eating the same thing irrespective of where they were in the world right and i think this again goes back to um goes back to what you talked about which is for them to essentially survive they needed to depend on scraps from human beings right and so what that meant is that whatever was accessible to human beings at that point in time leftovers of that were essentially given to dogs right and i find it very very hard to believe that culturally but also in terms of access to resource human beings for all of these years have only been eating meat based diets right and that's what has been given off to dogs as well um so yeah i mean we'd love to just hear your thoughts on that so i think this kind of <clears throat> brings us to one of the things i talk about dogs which is i think their biggest evolutionary advantage has been um their adaptability i think dogs are one of the very few animals that you will see in any ecosystem all over the world as long as there are human beings there are dogs <laughs> as soon yeah. as human beings turn up there are dogs it could be the arctic region it could be on top of mountains it could be in beaches tropical subtropical desert area you find dogs everywhere there isn't a and i think that speaks and free living dogs that's that's the coolest part of it right that yeah. is that they know how to survive as long as they are around human beings yeah here in the jungles of india as well you know they don't most people again like to romanticize dogs free living dogs as wild dogs but they are not in the jungles until we move into those forest areas as soon as human beings start moving in dogs start moving in which is you know mm. big cause for concern for wildlife conservationists as well um but i think their 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 revolutionary advantage there is their adaptability which is that whatever you eat we can survive on its scraps yeah. you know whatever temperature you are in we can figure out a way to exist in that temperature uh and whatever your cultural beliefs and you know so on and so forth are we can figure out how to um kind of work around it and be okay with it um so yeah i think adaptability is a huge part of it and uh and also let's not forget that human cultures it's not just about geography it's also about time right the point yeah. in time our diets have changed significantly our diets have changed over time significantly um uh food has been brought in from one part of the world to the other part of the world 
And just as our diets has changed, I think dogs uh, ability to handle these diets has also changed uh, and kept up with times. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's very critical in this conversation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I, again, I, I think, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm sort of flitting from one thought to the other as well, because in your previous um, comment, you, you also talked about this obsession that we have with looking at our dogs as mini wolves, and then modeling everything for them, keeping that in mind. But, you know, the example that like I keep, the, again, the example that I keep using to sort of question that is, you know, humans sort of evolved from an ape ancestor, right? That we share with chimpanzees, but humans don't eat like apes, right? Like we have, our diets have evolved and our choices have evolved and now we have access to resources. And sort of put that model that here's a, because there is, an, because it, it seems like from point A to point B, the dog has gone from wolf to dog, we must model it on what wolves eat seems exactly what you said, very limiting of not just the adaptations that have happened over the years, but also I think, I think also like individual adaptations for the dog, right? Um, and so for example, like the golden retriever that for example, I may have in my house today, may not actually share 100% coherence with the original golden retriever, right? Yeah. So it's really interesting, especially in the positive R plus trainer community, when we talk about, so this argument of, you know, they are mini wolves kind of a thing was used in many different areas, not just nutrition, but behavior too. Now that argument on about, you know, dogs being like mini wolves uh, in the behavior world is something we've let go. So all the wolf studies on behavior, we say, hey, not relevant anymore. Let's not look at that anymore. You know, they're a completely different species. The social structure is very different from that of wolves. You know, they are not pack animals the way wolves are. They don't behave that way. So let's not look at those studies. Uh, and the same set of people I've seen are like, oh, but let's look at their uh, wolf diet. Yeah. <clears throat> I think in, in terms of behavior, our focus is shifting a bit more towards free living animals. Not enough still, but I think that that movement has started. Uh, but in terms of diet, still, I think we're very, very hung up on looking yeah. at that and trying to replicate this. Uh, so, yes, first first up, that, that just doesn't add up, right? And like yeah. you said, because we evolved from ape doesn't mean we're eating, you know, we're going around eating worms and throwing poop at people, yeah. right? Like, <laughs> it, it, it's not necessarily, there, there is a point where we say there's enough genetic yeah. variation and morphological behavioral and diet differences to yeah. call this a different species yeah. right that yeah. thing happens um and so uh, i think and species that are very closely related can have significantly different behaviors diet preferences uh, and again i think our closest relatives you know if you look at bonobos and chimpanzees it should tell us yeah. that small yeah. dna difference can have significant differences in the way we live and behave and act and so on and so forth and eat and digest and yeah. drive and so on and so forth. So yeah. I think that that is definitely one part of it. And then, like you said, it's been 130 years in the making. So there is going to be further differences as well that we have to take into consideration. And then last but not the least, the individual differences. Just because the textbook says that this is good for you doesn't mean it's good for you. You may yeah. be somebody who comes and says gluten allergy, yeah. lactose intolerance, right? I can't say, oh, you know, human species is supposed to be able to eat wheat. And so you yeah. have to eat wheat. Yeah. There is that individual difference too that needs to be considered, which again seems to be completely removed from the conversation around dog nutrition. I, I see that happening for human nutrition too, to a great extent. Mm. I'll give you an example, which kind of, when I was a kid, I was, um, I was born in a place where um, the babies were generally bigger in size. Mm. Uh, and my mother was, uh, is a pediatrician. So her textbooks are all Western textbooks. Uh, so, you know, baby size, what the baby should eat and uh, things like that were mm. based on those books. I was a tiny baby and ate a lot less. 
and mm. my god my mother it caused so much anxiety in her because i wasn't eating as per the textbook for the textbook yeah mm. right and and to me i think that is so telling and that went on to create so much anxiety around food you know during my, my uh, formative years and even now it hasn't left me and i think that is the danger of dogma that is the danger of textbook yeah. i think you know we can get very very caught up in what should be rather than reading what it what is what is yeah. in front of us and it's funny right we spoke about this i think one of the recent conversations about don't get dogmatic about mm-hmm. it and i think food is one area where i really want to uh, uh, you know bring that in uh, yeah. because i think we get very very hung up on you know what one should be eating like you said a golden retriever in your house versus my house could be different absolutely absolutely for sure and i mean i think like i think the easiest thing to sort of equate it to is even among siblings right so much difference in choices and preferences and what we eat and how food supports our body in how food impacts us i mean just within siblings in the same family in the same household right and now even, even the m- multiple days the same individual and multiple days whether yeah. your internal yeah. state i'm anxious today i need to eat more of this today i simply cannot yeah. eat this today it's hot today i cannot eat this today it's really cold today i feel like eating this today those cravings um yeah. pregnancy cravings you know yeah. uh, stress yeah. cravings and these are all ways the body is telling you something it's telling you that there's a certain need that you can meet through food and diet and i'm going to keep sending signals to your brain to say eat eat till you meet that diet uh, that need and if you don't meet it the right way which is eat the wrong thing which is munch on chips yeah. or whatever yeah that signal will keep coming back to you coming you back to you the right way and you realize uh, uh, if you start looking at intuitive eating and functional eating with human beings you realize that there is a way to shut that voice there is a way to meet that need yeah. when that voice stops saying eat more eat more and the voice says ah you got it you have appreciated yeah yeah right? this is what i yeah. needed this is what your body needed to recover uh, versus uh, an addictive eating so that's lot of times when we talk mm. about you know meet the need listen to the voice the counter argument there is addictive eating right but that is it's it's like uh, it's like the body saying i need i have a need to calm down do some calming activity meditative activities and instead you go take drugs and then yeah. you can't you can't compare the two right obviously that's not so, listening yeah. to your body but the signal yeah. will be the same and i think food has a very similar um two aspects to it and um and then when you take ahana's question i'll add more to that as well yeah yeah i think again i mean i'm looking at um ahana's comment as well as akshay's comment and i think that you know since we're talking about diet i think we can get into a little bit of specifics here um and so the two arguments that have constantly come up in this narrative of dog nutrition is one is that all dogs thrive on meat based diets right uh, and so dogs are essentially carnivorous animals because they have come from wolves right that's one argument the second argument has been this absolute disdain for uh, uh carbohydrates and you know starchy foods in their diets right uh, it has been really about oh dogs can't dogs don't have the necessary enzymes to be able to break down starch process starch um and so so in your observation in your observation but also i i know that you used to feed you you feed and you continue to feed streeties and in your learning with the living dogs like what what is the feedback the bear giving you on some of these arguments oops uh you run mute i think if you look at street dogs um again i think people find it very difficult to look at street dogs so b- before we look at uh, that mm. i think this this another thing to this whole idea of they thrive not survive so mm. lot of people who talk about nutrition talk about it as if it's a done thing it's a proven science even with human beings but neither is true so even with human beings right so let's let's talk about this when we talk about this diet works well versus this diet doesn't work well what are we basing this on are we basing it mm. on peer reviewed studies if we think we are 
how exactly yeah. does one test a diet on a human being? Are you keeping them imprisoned for a span of five years and feeding them only X, Y, Z diet? Yeah. Not possible. Are you sending them home and believing that they're sticking to your diet? Yeah. Not wise. So then how exactly are you testing these to say proven that this mm. yes. has this effect? Yes. This is very hard. Nutrition science in general is very hard. I did ask somebody, they said, you know, dogs need this much protein, this much. I said, where is that evidence? Mm. <laughs> Even for human beings, right? It's a close approximation. And a lot of the approximation comes from deficiency, studying deficiencies, which is that it's the minimum requirement that we study from. If you don't yeah. get enough of iron, you will have yeah. anemia. If you don't get enough of this micronutrient, you will have this. But, uh, and the other extreme, if you take this much of it, you will die. Yeah. Or you will get this disease. So those two, uh, uh, you know, we can, we can talk about those two and those two can be tested. Yeah. They can be lab tested on dogs. But the conversation about this is better than this, this makes you live versus this makes you thrive, that is just a, that's a, that's a philosophical discussion. That's, that's a, yeah. a, you know, and that's an opinion-based discussion. And then in which case, if you're looking at it and, you know, we are, we are bringing in natural history, then again, going back to wolves is not necessarily the right way to do it. We're going back to dogs and seeing what makes them thrive, right? You're talking right. about thrive, right? Now, when we talk about thrive in the case of free living animals, what is thrive? How do you mm. measure thrive? Are you measuring thrive based on population numbers? That's how you measure thrive yeah. with, with other animals, right? Are you measuring thrive based on lifespan? How exactly do you measure lifespan of a free living dog? Who's done that work? Are yeah. you measuring thrive based on blood, blood test and studies and some indicators of some kind? That hasn't been done on free living dogs. So it becomes yeah. very difficult. But it all becomes very anecdotal after that. And it all becomes about looking at, I've heard things like, oh, you know, free living dogs in impoverished countries like India, that's not a conversation worth having. We should look at free living dogs in rich countries. Is that the, uh, is that the environment in which mm. dogs evolved? So will you then say that, you know, free living tigers in India is not exactly, yeah. don't look at any studies on them. Let's look at free living tigers in Siberia or I'm sorry, in somewhere in Europe, because I'm not sure Siberia is considered very rich either. So somewhere in Europe, is that the only benchmark we look at? Like these conversations don't make sense, right? So a lot of the tribe conversations don't make sense. What makes a free living dog type? The ability to eat any damn thing they can find and survive. Yeah. Right. And that means that to a large extent, uh, they, their ability to mirror our diet is what makes them thrive. Over and over, that's what it will come down to. It's their ability yeah. to mirror our diet. Uh, uh, a free living animal that says that I can only thrive on meat is not a dog that's going to mm. thrive in terms of right. numbers. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Or lifespan. Right, yeah. they have to have the mechanism in there, and they do. They do. They do have the ability. They do have some amount of um, amylase, salivary amylase, to handle, and which is significantly different from wolves. That tells us that there is that. Yeah. Uh, what do you say? That uh, <clears throat> adaptation ability, to yeah. carbs, but. Yeah not necessarily uncooked carbs, but cooked carbs, which again makes complete sense. They're not going to go and forage and eat grass and veggies. You know, they're not going to go into your fields and eat your pumpkin. Instead, they're going to be sitting outside your kitchen saying, give me cooked <laughs> pumpkin, right? Yeah. And that's probably what they've been doing all along for 130,000 years, which makes sense that they can't digest raw veggies and raw carbs, but they seem to have the mechanism in place to digest cooked Cook. carbs and veggies. Yeah. yeah. The other problem in the whole carb discussion is it's almost carbs have been demonized. Uh, carbs have been demonized not with dogs. It started with carbs being demonized with human beings. And a large part of that goes credit to starting with the Australian meat industry. Yeah. Right. That's a marketing thing. So I think there's a paper on it. I'll try and dig it up. It was there in my first term. We were talking about um, a lot of rhetoric 
even in human beings that you know meat is absolutely required for our survival mm. for for not survival for thriving carbs are the demon and things like that and a large part of it is marketing um, yeah. you know it is it's a marketing language um if you look at ancient uh, um uh, health systems like ayurveda there isn't that kind of a heavy 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 emphasis on <clears throat> uh, just meat consumption and it could never have been the case yeah yeah, yeah. never have the amount of meat that is being eaten by the world right now is only possible through large scale factory farming any yeah. other form of even farming and if you go to hunting it's not even possible to consume this much meat you cannot be hunting this many animals and sustaining you know having a self sustaining population around you and surviving and yeah. if you look at a lot of uh, today the existing um, gatherer hunter cultures um they have a lot of uh, what do you say um rituals around hunting where either pre hunt or post hunt the hunter and the consumers uh subject themselves to extraordinary pain as as, uh, as uh, reparation for reparation for the kill yeah. that they're doing and these are all mechanism you can't do that for morning breakfast afternoon you know lunch and dinner <laughs> you can't keep you know breaking your bones you know in a ritual dance yeah. for breakfast lunch and dinner and hunting that much meat so that that natural history based yeah. argument falls through it is a it is a product of post factory farming that we have come up with this yeah. and more recent studies actually do tell us that you know heavily meat meat based diets are not necessarily making human beings thrive they are causing disease they yeah. are causing zoonosis they are causing things like cholesterol so that is happening um uh, 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 even with human beings and i think that is the kind of extension that we move in couple that in with this romanticization of you know hey we have this carnivore that we have you know uh, mm -hmm. uh, kind of gotten under our control and you know, we have dominated and got under our control put those together it's a it's again uh, a conversation based in toxic masculinity yeah right? your your ideas of capitalism toxic masculinity patriarchy come very much in the the very notion anthropologically the very notion that we were heavy heavy meat eaters that itself uh, that that was the beginning of um, you know patriarchal uh, discourse uh yeah. it's i think that it's it's worth looking at meat eating and feminism uh, you know that intersectionality and you'll find literature mm -hmm. around this which debunks this idea but yeah. for anybody who comes in and gives you like a very very simplistic hey meat good you know meat makes us all uh, <laughs> kind of thing, you go and have this conversation it's far too nuanced they're not going to have yeah. the patience to sit and listen to it right uh, they're just it's yeah difficult <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, I, I resonate with this completely, right? Because I think that, and and again, I, I go back to, I go back to what I started by saying, you know, food is a cultural symbol, right? And and food is a way to um, represent communities. It can also be a way to impose certain ideas and beliefs on people. and so even the even the conversation on nutrition cannot be devoid of those aspects right cannot be devoid of some of those influences on how we eat again right and and, and how our dogs eat as well and again there's you know and we obviously I'll share the papers as well but there's 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 a fair amount of research done on on dogs in in madhya pradesh in poland in baluchistan in zimbabwe um on free living dogs on diets of free living dogs and they all the diet constitutes of everything that is regional and local to those areas yeah, i have yeah. to go for a second break because my yes. dog wants to come in okay just yes, absolutely yeah um i'm also looking just through the comments actually yes ahana uh, so um, i i i resonate with your muscle bound piece because i remember when you know julia was doing a garland a uh, webinar and she was talking about how um you know we we were shown images of these dogs with like you know really really like carved out muscles and we say that that's a really good sign of a healthy dog but she actually said that this is you know this is this is a result of like overloading this is a result of stretching and and wear and tear and 
that's not like the that that's not the image of a of an ideal healthy dog right um sorry so do you want to add to that yeah yeah so i think that that's an interesting one as well again you know this is uh, so uh, influenced by our the cultural the six pack culture right uh when you talk about a six pack you're talking about muscles that are so 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 contracted uh high high tone muscles mm. on one side and so for instance if you have you know massively high tone muscles on the bicep but not necessarily balanced on the other side uh you can create in um, you know an issue with imbalance um a lot of uh very very tight muscles on the stomach but uh not enough on the back can cause back issues so when you're going that heavily compressed you are going to you know create imbalance because you have to it's very hard to create balance you're not focusing on balance the focus there is on building those muscles that look aesthetically appealing you know emphasis on those muscles so because there is balance is not uh, part of that equation so i think that's one part of the argument the other part of the argument of course is you know these highly highly toned up muscles lose their elasticity longevity comes from elasticity not from tightness and when we talk about health what is it that we talk about health the discourse around health itself has gone for a toss health today seems to stand for skinny toned muscles not necessarily i can you know live for a long long period of time being functional <clears throat> the example i keep giving is many of us if we went back three four generations we can see that healthy people from those generations are people who in their 70s 80s are able to continue to engage in day to day activities without you know knee pain leg pain and look at our generation i look at me right my knees are already cut 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 i can hear the noise there and i used to be a marathon runner yeah i exercise like a maniac right running ultra marathons dancing at the same time you know diving swimming all of those things and i have so many injuries based on all of that and all the injuries have caught up with me at this point and we that's we know that about people who are ultra fit is that you know post 35 40 45 yeah. the injuries catch up so then is that health or have we become so myopic about health that our definition of health is look look awesome for two decades and then burn out and get done with it we don't care after that that yeah. our, that's what our definition has become just yeah. the way <clears throat> if you look at um a lot of capitalistic um ideas of productivity they're all like that right get them young and very worked up and burn them out completely burn them out yeah. in two three years and get get rid of them after that you know and and the thing is i'll make enough money for you to retire after that but you're burnt out yeah. that's not productivity at least that's not what the conversation around productivity used to be at one point of time it was longevity how long can you continue to create and produce um <clears throat> and what is the cost of this this intense kind of whatever that we see for a short period of time and then burnt out at the end mm-hmm. what is the cost of it that long tail burnt out is it really relaxation burnt out yeah. no more work or is it a kind of mental turmoil where we are you know not able to deal with it these are long term studies that are missing so to yeah. buy into these ideas as you know this is fitness fitness is mm-hmm. lose weight lose weight lose weight is only one direction to go lose weight build muscle and that is fitness that doesn't give us longevity longevity on the other hand is elastic muscles longer muscles food that not makes us lose weight all the time but keeps us balanced in a state of somewhat balance somewhat you know yeah. good health balance mental balance emotional balance physical balance and and that balance game <clears throat> is an everyday game yeah absolutely you know you have to keep balancing go to the left a little mm. go to the right a little yeah. that there what happens is then a marketable recipe a marketable packet of food all those go out of the window because yeah. you're balancing yeah. constantly and it's highly inconvenient for those selling products yeah. and uh and and things like recipes right uh it it becomes highly unmarketable so i can understand why, why there is such a heavy emphasis on something that talks about you know go into something dogmatic and forget the idea of balance balance is not at all marketable it's a very mom and pop non scalable idea yeah. 
but again you know i think this is the space where we can have the courage to talk about it yeah yeah and i and i think it's it's so interesting right because again i and and i'll respond to akshay's comment as well but i think from a from a practicing place i think you know i think i am now struggling to provide support that is dogmatic right like i'm finding it very hard to you know talk to pet parents without asking them to be intuitive without asking them to read the dog without asking them to get feedback from the dog like i i just feel like you know i i think so so many practicing nutrition consultants especially in the dog space are this is the this is the perfect diet this is what you have to follow this will change your dog's life and i'm finding it and i started there because i think that's what even training for example the way that we are educated and trained on this is 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 primed for us to do but i'm finding it very hard to do it anymore because i'm just like at the end of the day this is your dog right i have i have guidelines and i know for example i can give you information on what is safe and what is unsafe what is toxic what is not toxic what could potentially increase inflammation reduce inflammation but even with it, in that there are so many individual variations right and so it's almost now i feel like when i when i practice i find it very hard to i think it's 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 no longer for me it's now i think the diet and the nutrition needs for a dog have now become shared responsibility with the pet parent it's no longer me solely responsible to give you this diet chart anymore right it has now become a little bit of a collaborative um you know uh like collaborate process sorry i was looking at anna's comment and laughing a little bit my dog takes so we diet chats with a side of random road scrap i love that um yeah okay so um, i think that uh, that yeah. struggle surabhi is the same that we see in behavior too right if you look at a lot of uh classical behaviorism i think classical behaviorism is also a very um nice easy to package in a dogma for to package in textbooks follow step 1 step 2 step 3 i loved it as an engineer that was just like i love it like an ikea furniture thing right like step 1 step 2 step 3 yeah. you know make these charts and follow it um and it was a very heartbreaking journey uh, to unlearn that to get to a point where i could say no it really depends on the dog there is no shortcut to this there is no shortcut to figuring out what works for the dog it's not that i can prep everything and then walk in and uh, walk into the situation and i'm going to nail it you know that's not the way it is and there is going to be messiness there is going to be <clears throat> um a lot of uh, humble pie eating <laughs> sessions yeah um kind yeah. of a thing um so i think it's the same thing i think that you're going to you're facing with nutrition which is that there are going to be a whole bunch of people who are going to say no this is the way to do things because we are only competent to the degree that we are going to be able to give dogma we don't have the ability to read the mm. rest now what does reading the rest mean think about it because now it's no more about nutrition you have to read yeah. behavior you have to yeah. read health indicators you have to read gait you have to understand anatomy physiology biosocial psychology yeah. ethology that whole thing that that's why backbed is that the course that it is right because yeah. it's that whole thing that you have to be aware of and that is a huge amount of learning for an individual for a dog which in yeah. today's day and age we don't have that we have a lot of people who are kind of and as as a culture we're all going towards you know specialize in one thing learn one thing mm. i'm just a separation anxiety expert i'm just a this expert i'm just a you know pre model diet expert i'm just a this expert we are, and we are shoehorning ourselves into these things we do not want to be associated with anything else uh, <clears throat> that learning journey is so difficult that it's going to be very very difficult for somebody to do what you would be capable of doing given mm. a wider set of knowledge that you have and so you are going to be a direct threat to anybody who uh, you know is not equipped with all of the other things so it is a difficult journey i think the question then boils down to what do we do <laughs> yeah 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 
We come sure. together work with very few clients, but <laughs> yeah. the right thing or yeah. do we go mass market and say fine? If you want this, take this. Yeah. Yeah, and that's a that's the constant struggle, day to day struggle as well. Um, and I, and I think that like I think that's my other you know problem. And again, I'm I'm looking through some of the comments, and I, I can see like glimmers of some of that there. I think I think in general, like we've made nutrition out to be like this magic bullet that solves and cures everything, and that's the only thing to focus you know so if your dog is struggling to cope change the diet right like add inflammation reducing foods and see the difference right if your dog is struggling whatever your dog may be struggling with it seems like diet is the short short way to fix it and i i fundamentally disagree with that i don't think that that's how it works right and even again when we look at free living dogs i think what you said about their ability to eat whatever they want to eat whenever they want to eat there is also that is also agency to me it's less about food but more about how they are accessing that it's more about how they able to do that and i feel like in conversations again with you know pet dogs obviously you know at at, at parks we talk about it a lot but i think even in the whole nutrition world i feel like some of those factors just do not get addressed at all right the idea of choice the idea of individual preference the idea of um you know having access to uh, a calm lifestyle environment um i think just looking at just individual differences just completely gets missed out yeah and uh, you know I, I used to say point this out earlier dogs care about few things in life it's not that they want you know gucci shoes you know the latest uh, iphone no there are a few things yeah. they care about in life one of them at the top priority is food if we yeah. can't give them choice on that come on where is the joy in living right that's yeah. one of the main things food social circle sleep Th- these are primary things and yeah. in- three areas it's all about our personal beliefs that's what it's boiled down to right you will eat yeah. what my textbook says or whatever my mentor says or whatever you know my latest youtube fad says is the best thing you will eat that you will sleep in a cage that i created that i you know use euphemisms to uh, explain yeah. away but you know you will sleep there and you will meet the dogs that i deem that you should be meeting you will meet the ones that i think you should meet you will not meet the ones i do not think you should meet and you will interact with them the way i think is appropriate and that kind of ties back to the auditorium event that we are having this month where we talk about yeah. play because somebody came in saying you know got very prescriptive all that that is not nice play you're not a dog <laughs> <laughs> you're neither yeah. parties in that game right the two of them are playing give me a give me a insight into how you interact with your friends i'll have a comment or two to say about that <laughs> right yeah right yeah. like we can't take choice away from you know these three things i understand that we can't give you know seven course menu you know with to the dog you know which what would you like sir today like i i get that but yeah. uh i i think my husband uttam showed me that uh despite not doing that there was a beautiful way to bring in choice uh, he constantly always for him no matter what uh, you know nutrition expert i brought into the picture for uttam the ultimate decision of what they what was right for the dogs came from the dogs so he yeah. he paid attention and the way he did it is he paid close attention he would serve the food up and he did that to me too so i know it was mm. you know done beautifully from a place of love it was not feeding from a place of love versus feeding from a place of dogma and you know putting ourselves in the center are two different kind of things so i remember him sitting and watching uh, what do you eat first what do you tend to eat last what do you go for you know and what yeah. do you seem to take your time and cherish and eat and really enjoy it dogs do that too right there are things they will gobble up and there are things that they will mm, this is yum so what are those things uh, what yeah. are the smells that they find interesting paying attention to those things and dogs are so intuitive about their bodies that they give us pretty good feedback on it so yeah. factoring choice in can be done in a very very beautiful way that is not just about their mental health but also 
see how our themes keep coming back together attachment connection yeah. relationship absolutely absolutely um i mean I, i'm i'm seeing a few comments and i'm wondering you know since again we we're, we're sort of close to wrapping up as well i i think what i wanted to sort of move into and maybe we can use that as a way to address something that bindu has sort of talked about again just in terms of the comparison between how streeties digest certain kinds of food versus how pedigree dogs digest i think and 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 let me know since if this question makes sense and you can sort of address that there i think for me what i wanted to sort of really end this space with thinking about is how how would we like in an ideal world or how should some of these observations and you know learning about evolution of dogs evolution of their eating habits influence the discourse on dog nutrition moving forward so i think the main takeaway from the discussion on evolution needs to be that we need to get rid of dogma and understand this flexibility right that's what it boils down to so i am not yeah. going to come from a place of okay let's get rid of the uh, the you know wolf argument let's bring in streety argument uh, streety in zimbabwe eat you know the 30% carbs so let's put 30% carbs in yeah that's you're just taking one philosophy and putting it on another you know it's taking offerings from one god and putting it to another kind of a thing yeah. it's still religion it's still dogma it's not the way yeah. to go right i think the biggest lesson for us from observing free living dogs has to be that there is flexibility there is cultural variation there is individual variation and that they are capable of it's not one food category one type that they are eating it is they are capable as a species of eating a whole bunch of things that humans yeah. can eat and humans tend to throw away that's kind yeah. of where they are uh, you know that's that's their uh, small gas board if you may right yeah. like that's their that's their buffet which is yeah. a list of things that tend to fall in their natural diet tend to be our whatever tends to be in our you know our waste so cooked food yeah. um, to a great extent cooked veggies kind of a thing and uh, raw meat yes that also is part of our waste um, and cooked meat as well right that's also part yeah. of our uh, so that i think is what they're capable of digesting and uh, from there we pick up and say okay now what works for this individual dog breeding yes has its problems where breeding does bring in certain problems but again to make generalizations on a certain mm. breed or you know kind of breeding you are again going down the dogma path which is to say so and so said that you know this breed eats this that's like i'm getting a manual for oh okay you know <laughs> your toyota car uh, uh, model number so and so has to work this way no every yeah. time we do this kind of prescriptive thing let's remember that we're going back to the idea of mechanomorphism right the idea yeah. that they're machines the idea that they will follow a catalog the idea that they will follow a, a what is a product specification type of thing right they will not do that so anybody who tells you that this is a breed thing this is the way they work this is the way everybody works it breed information is what you add on to give you more context into what you're observing but your observation but, your dog is the expert of your dog that's it yeah. period right yeah. and to give make sense of that you could say okay could this aspect be coming in from a breed angle could this be coming mm. from a breeding angle could this yeah. be coming from the way they were bred um those those uh, you can bring insights to make sense yeah. to it but work with the feedback that your dog is giving i think for me that's 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 always i i think i've learned from enough experts disagreed with enough of them the world over hurt myself enough to finally come down to this i really don't care what others say i'll take all of your input in i'll take all of my own knowledge in i don't even i don't even trust my own knowledge on this i'll take all of that in but the last say on something is my dogs yeah absolutely if i find my dog was getting wired up because of some food i will reduce if i find my dog getting lazy i will change something if i find my dog uh, getting rashes i will change it and it doesn't matter what anybody says yeah yeah absolutely absolutely i love that i i, I mean I, i think yes i think for me like i think a big one has just been can we just move away from these labels of dogs are vegetarian dogs are non vegetarian dogs are vegan and can we just hold space to just include variety 
right? And, and just offer as many choices as possible. And even within that, not get very dogmatic, right? Because again, there will be individual dogs who don't like variety and there will be some who enjoy it significantly. But I think moving away from those labels, because I think that just puts an incredible amount of like pressure to conform um, and, and, and just feel not very good about the relationship that we're building with food and our dogs. Um, I also think with the, you know, with the point and I think breathing, sometimes I, sometimes I really want to laugh because I feel like, you know, this, this argument has come up, you know, they're not bred really well. And so you have to feed this kind of diet, but I'm like, but we ignore all the other aspects of their lives. Right? They're not bred very well, but we will make sure that they're playing multiple hours of fetch, doing high intensity workouts. Um, you know, doing all of these other things that are taking a toll on their system. And so again, I find that it seems like the conversation on dog nutrition runs on its own parallel, like runs on its own independent track, devoid of all other aspects of the dog's life. And I think maybe one of the things to sort of really think about is how do we make it more integrated? How do we, how do we see them as interdisciplinary or aspects of a dog's lies that are actually constantly talking to each other as opposed to oh nutrition has a separate worldview behavior has a separate worldview health has a separate worldview right it isn't it's all coming together at the end of the day and i think if there's space to be able to do more of that i think i think we can we can definitely have a wider conversation yeah. it's the whole point about holistic right and that is kind of the the biggest accusation of western medicine or science in general is the reductionism that's part of it and if you look at indigenous cultures if you look at old cultures you will see that their health systems are often closely tied with emotional support systems tied with spirituality and the reason and this is for human beings but the reason they're all tied together is mm -hmm. you can't fix uh, you know, uh, say, I will forget the fact that you have anxiety. I will not give you any support there. I'll just treat you with some herbs. And trying to do it that way. <clears throat> and modern science yeah. trying to test ancient, ancient uh, systems struggle because of this, because they look at it very myopically, you know. Oh, oh you say mm -hmm. that herb works for anxiety. I'll just test that, that herb for anxiety. But what they don't realize is a holistic system. Most traditional systems don't actually work with just one herb. They will work with the herb, but they'll introduce that herb into, you know, food. And that food will be yeah. something that has to do with anxiety. And they will add that in with some breathing practices. They will add that in with social practices. They will, they will add that in with support systems. And, you know, the thing comes together. And together, they bring something, you know, a, a holistic change for yeah. the individual. And I think that's the same with our dogs. And uh, so, you know, what I would do is whenever somebody tells me something, I will go research that particular ingredient or that particular exercise or practice for what it's supposed to do, what it's not supposed to do. But then when I'm bringing it in, I'm bringing it in more holistically. I'm bringing yeah. it in with, you know, what else do I need? What do I have to look out for? And bringing it in with feedback so that I realize that I'm bringing it in holistically. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, cool. So we are out of time. Although Our time flies. <laughs> I still have so much more to say. <laughs> we could have gone on for another hour, two hours. Or maybe we can do like a part two of this at a later point in time and, and build off. Um, thank you so much, Sindhu. This is so amazing and so cathartic for me. <laughs> uh, but it was awesome. Um, unfortunately... We don't, we, we don't have time for too many questions and comments, but if there is something that's really burning for you, uh, for everybody here, just please feel free to reach out on each of the individual channels and, you know, we will, we will sort of address that. Um, and again, if, if there's something that comes up, you know, unanimously for a, for a larger group of people, we'll do another uh, webinar very soon. But thank you so much for being here um, on the Saturday morning. Hope this was helpful. And yeah, thank you, everyone. Have a lovely weekend. Have a lovely Saturday. Thank you.